everyone. I'm Dr. Alyssa Watson. And I'm Dr. Beth Mollison. Thanks for joining us in the veterinary break room. In the vet break room, Dr. Beth and I have short conversations where we just chat informally about relevant topics in veterinary medicine. And today we're going to be talking about recording appointments. Um, there's a couple sides to this and we will get into both, you know, whether or not veterinary practices and veterinarians are, are recording or should be recording appointments as well as um, what happens when a client wants to record appointments. This um, actually has come up for me personally. Uh, most of you at home, you know, if you've listened to the podcast before, you know that I am, I kind of split my time between a few shifts of general practice a month, as well as in-home hospice and euthanasia. And actually this week I had two appointments, um, two separate appointments where when I arrived at the home to perform end of life services, the clients asked me if they could record. Um, and one of them actually had the, the iPhone set up with a ring lamp and everything kind of focused <laughs> on the area where we were going to be performing the euthanasia when I, when I stepped into the room. And so, you know, it's, it, there situations like that give me pause just for a second. You know, I ultimately let both of these people record their appointments because if that's what they needed, you know, to deal with their grief, that was fine with, I was fine with that. I'm very glad they asked me um, because I certainly know that there are, are probably situations, you know, when I think about it, where I could have and probably have been recorded without my knowledge even. Um, you know, a lot of people have uh, recording devices in their home, nanny cameras and things like that. And so I kind of go into all of these appointments, assuming that, that I could potentially be recorded. <laughs> Um, but it brings up a lot of questions about what are the ethics of recording? You know, are there are there pros for the veterinarian and for the client in recording conversations? Um, and, you know, obviously euthanasia appointments are kind of their own uh, kind of, you know, their own particular event as opposed, opposed to other appointments. But um, so I was excited to have this conversation. Dr. Beth, have you do you. Have you run into instances where clients have asked you to record uh, their appointment or does your practice generally record appointments, you know, all the time? Yeah, great question. And I cannot think of too many scenarios where I have come across this. And Alyssa, I'm a little bit different than you. You know, I don't do the in-home euthanasia, so it would just be the exam room circumstances. And even then, it's kind of hard to to think back because I feel like the last few years have been so heavy with like drop off appointments and curbside service that um, I feel like it's been a long time since anybody has asked to record an appointment. And I feel like it's usually done like an audio recording. I can remember one time where like the, the pet owner was elderly and had been brought there by a car service and um, or a relative or something like that. And we recorded the appointment. But I do kind of going back to what you're saying, I almost feel like it's two different all games, at least to me, the euthanasia recording versus these other appointments. And, you know, I, I was surprised to hear you say you had had two people record your euthanasias recently, because when I think of recording euthanasias, to me, I could see it from the vet side of things. Um, so maybe we can get into that. But it, it was, it, I'm just trying to envision a, a time where I would want it and we're not all the same, so it doesn't have to be about me, but I'm just thinking a time where I would want my pet's euthanasia recorded and I can't imagine myself re-watching it many times, um, but everyone's different. Like you said, maybe they needed it for closure. Um, but when I think about recording euthanasias, I do, especially in-home euthanasias, think about it from kind of that protection of the veterinarian themselves. And um, I did read an article as well that uh, was kind of looking into the ethics of that because there was a euthanasia vet who has that as a standard part of their protocol. So I did want to ask you about that, Alyssa, from the vet perspective. I kind of liked some of the points they made in that article where, um, you know, euthanasia, mm -hmm. obviously that is a very serious event. Um, and kind of from the vet perspective, there might be some pros to wanting to have that recorded. Is that something you ever consider doing like on a regular basis? 
So I don't record my appointments. Um, I also, I read the same blog you did um, after we started talking about having this conversation. And it was a blog post that was in Psychology Today. And it was about the veterinarian recording, not with video, just with audio. And I think that makes a difference too, you know, whether or not we're Mm -hmm. talking about video recording versus audio recording, because I think many people are much more uncomfortable, you know, with with video than they are with just audio. Um, But audio still gives you a nice objective record of what happened during the appointment. And so um, there are definitely some things that would be super helpful. Um, Number one is just like going back and, and little things. Sometimes I will get to a home and there are 10 people present. Um, And so we, you know, generally I try to ask everyone's name and really involve people in this appointment so that we can really honor their pet and their pet's passing. And um, I will tell you in, in going through all of, all of the appointment and um, making sure that everyone's comfortable and, and making sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. Sometimes I'll get out to the car or back home and want to write my record or send a sympathy card. And I, I don't remember everyone's name, you know? And mm-hmm. so those are times where I'm like, gosh, it would be really, really helpful, you know, to have something. Um, outside of the euthanasia setting, same thing with, with appointments. You start getting, I start getting going crazy appointments and I might have one or two appointments back to back before I can sit down and write down, you know, write my records for a particular case. And Mm -hmm. I will tell you things like, oh my gosh, what digit was that? You know, was it, was it the third (laughs) digit that had the broken nail? You know, was it the fourth? Um, So those types of things, I think would be, you know, there's, there's really some utility there um, that I hadn't thought about previously. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. What about you? Do you think that, that you could find, you know, some sort of helpfulness in having a recording? Yeah. I was going to say, like you said, I think uh, we've all been in situations, I feel like where we do wish we had had a recording, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Like you said, if we can't remember right versus left to something more serious where the circumstance I keep thinking back to is, you know, of course, like the he sh- he said, she said thing, or really the one that always um, gets to me is like one pet parent brings the pet in and then the other pet owner, you know, has a completely different interpretation of what was said in the exam room. Like I could really see it being useful there where it's like, all right, one pet owner's bringing this pet in. We're going to record this conversation so that you can play it directly for your partner and we don't have to have them calling later for explanation about what was done or what was said. Or I think we've even talked about this before on the podcast, but I feel like so many client complaints go back to the fact that um, not all the pet owners are always in this room at this at one time and they miss kind of some of that nuanced conversation. So I could see it being really useful in that regard. Um, and then going to the euthanasia thing, you know, one thing I always ask you about with your in-home euthanasia, Alyssa, is you know what it feels like going into people's home and just the safety aspect of it. So from that mm-hmm. perspective, you know, obviously you mentioned some of the pros, but to me, I'm not in your shoes, but I could really also see it just almost telling the pet owner that this will be recorded to me almost adds some element of safety or where they're going to maybe act more inappropriate or, um, you know, just kind of keep everyone on the same page a little bit more. So I could see it being beneficial there. Um, and then of course, doc, like you said, documenting all the medical records, timing of everything, making sure consent is documented. I could see that being really beneficial from the euthanasia perspective as well. But then, you know, getting into some of the cons, when I think of a pet owner wanting to come in and record us, I think we can all all think of a few pet owners who we would be nervous to have every little word we said (laughs) put down in permanent record. Um, Because, you know, a lot of times we're talking off the cuff, maybe the words don't always come out right the first time and we have to rephrase things or clarify things or call them back and discuss things in more detail. So, you know, the last thing you want, if you can envision just any sound clip that you've ever made in an exam room winding up on social media, you know, I think we could all think of a few circumstances where maybe that wouldn't be what we would want. Um, 
And this, this blog post that we found also did bring up an interesting, or, or I should say important point, which is the legality of it. And that's, of course, a, a situation too that varies by state. So some states have, um, where you have to have dual consent, I think they called it, uh, where all mm-hmm. the parties involved yeah. in the conversation have to approve the recording. But I think they said 38 states maybe just have one party consent where only one of you mm-hmm. um, has to approve the recording. And that could be, you know, you, if you're involved in the conversation, you count as one party. So that was really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. That is interesting. And I think the other thing that comes into play there is legality is one thing, um, you know, so obviously you need to find out whether or not this is legal in your state. But even on top of that, even if it's legal, how do you, you know, is it ethical? Is it ethical mm-hmm. to record somebody's appointment without their knowledge? And and I think that there's lots of ways, you know, you can get around that. I mean, not I don't mean get around it. I mean, see, there's a perfect example of something <laughs> that, you know, you said that could be taken with a little soundbite kind of out of context. <laughs> um, and I do want to talk more about that. But um, there are ways to do that. Um, that don't take up a lot of time. Uh, you know, you can have it in your consent form, that particular veterinarian. I think that, that you know, that blog post was, was talking about has it on their website and in their consent that when you book this appointment and we come into your home to do these end of life services, you are going to be recorded. She also informs them, you know, uh, you know, uh, so informs them at the beginning of the appointment that, that she's recording. And so, so there's that you can, if you're in practice, you can have a sign posted that says, you know, all appointments are recorded for, you know, either for security purposes or for, um, you know, quality assurance or quality control. Isn't that what they always say when, <laughs> when you're on the phone? This this conversation may be recorded for quality control. <laughs> and yeah, you do raise a good point, Alyssa, because I think it does matter how it's told. You know, that trust is so important, especially in a serious setting like the euthanasia, where you don't want them to find out, you know, maybe in the receipt, see it in the small print and feel like they were duped or they didn't know about it or, you know, where was the recording? Was it in their pocket? Was it just, you want that to kind of make sure that they know about it ahead of time. Um, The other interesting thing that I think was brought up in that article was whether or not people should be able to opt out of it. Um, And to me, and they kind of offered that as a suggestion for people who are uncomfortable with it, but I think it, maybe it's a safety issue that I keep coming back to, but to me, it kind of feels like if you're going to record everyone, you know, you should record everyone. I just feel like if someone then opts mm-hmm. out of it, that raises a little bit of an eyebrow to me, you know, like, why are we opting out of this? What is the concern? Obviously, there are valid concerns to that, I think. But um, I kind of like the idea of it being more of a standard policy that if you're going to do it, it's just something that's done. Um, again, like you said, for that quality assurance, quality control purposes, um, and it's just kind of standard across the board. Yeah, I do think that that's a really important point that people should be able to opt out, at least in video, um, because I know certainly there are some people can have safety concerns that you're not aware of um, with their their identity or, you know, say a a. Um, an ex significant other or something like that is, is looking for them. You know, there's just a lot of things out there that we, we really, there's a lot more to be aware of in today's digital age than there was, Mm -hmm. you know, before when we back, back when I was young. (laughs) (laughs) So, but, um, I was really interested, you know, after reading this and, and we, we started talking about, you know, how many practices really are um, recording appointments. And so we actually put a little poll out uh, through Clinician's Brief to see. And um, Dr. Beth, do you want to tell us the results of that poll? Yeah, I would. And I would say it's maybe, well, I'll just give you the results. Um, So 87% of people said their practice does not record any appointments. Um, Let's see, 4% said some or all. 
3% says just audio, some or all, and then 5% says yes, that they do record audio and video of some or all appointments. So that was probably what I would expect, but it did, of course, leave me with more questions. I want to know, you know, what parameters are people using? Is it, um, you know, maybe for euthanasias or at-home appointments that are making up those percentages? Is it maybe some practices just use it for particular particular clients, particular types of conversations. It, it raised more curiosity questions for me than anything, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, wondering. And there were about um, 335 respondents to that poll. Mm-hmm. So not a huge number either. Um, but I do I do think probably, you know, across the board, I would say the majority of, of practices at this time are not recording their appointments, I think. Mm-hmm. But it is, it's interesting. I encourage people to look up their state and see what the legality of, is, mm-hmm. of it legality of it is. Um, again, not that everyone follows the law, but I just think it's interesting. I don't know if I ever consciously realized that legally I could be being recorded all the time by pet owners and they had no obligation um, to let me know. So it's certainly a topic that brings up a lot of interesting perspectives and different situations and um you know, uh, like we talked about, I think there are some pros of it. So maybe it's something that people do when it's so easy to do in this digital age, like you said, that people may want to implement for various reasons. Well, with that, that brings us to the end of the episode and maybe we can share a little win of the week. (laughs) Yes, I have a, uh, well, I guess I don't know for sure if it's a win of the week or not, but this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. Um, And that's because it is here in Cincinnati. It's the biggest wiener race of the year. It is Oktoberfest here. (laughs) And every year Cincinnati's Oktoberfest, which I think is still the biggest one outside of Germany, um, is it's kicked off by a wiener race. So I'm a proud dachshund owner and Paul has participated in um, he's 10 now. I want to say this will be his maybe seventh. Oktoberfest wiener race. And again, like I said, I don't know that I'm expecting a win from him, but I am expecting that he tries his best. He is 10 now, so uh, his performance may not be what it once was, but one year he did make it to the finals. Um, So I would be thrilled if he made it to the finals again. But anyway, it's going to be great weather. It's usually like a thousand degrees for Oktoberfest, but I think it's actually going to be nice this year. So um, keep your fingers crossed for little Paul. I will have to give a follow up afterward. But again, we just hope he has fun. I, I just hope he has fun too. Good luck to Paul. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, my win is not not even animal related. I was going to say it's not clinical related. It's not even animal related this week. That's all but, right. We will um, accept it anyway. <laughs> So I, um, I have this thing about chasing credit card, like rewards, credit card oh. rewards and points. <laughs> okay. So okay. Okay. I, I had the best Friday last week because my bank had 10% cash back if I used my debit card online at my grocery store. And so like, so I bought $160 worth of groceries and I got 10% back from my bank just by, you know, going through the little link that they said. But then it also happened to be four times gas points (laughs) if you ordered online (laughs) and and pick up at at the grocery store. So I got four times gas points for that $160. And then I went and got a full tank of gas and I used my Southwest credit card and got five times miles at gas stations <laughs> for, for the month of Alyssa, October. So, I didn't know this about you. I feel like I'm seeing another side I, of you all of a sudden. <laughs> I absolutely chase You're credit a money card saver. rewards and points. <laughs> I might have to hand over my details to you then because I... I am the opposite. Like I would love to be into it. And then I don't, I don't pay it. I have, I don't put in the effort, but I'm glad to see there's someone out there making it work for them. And I'm very glad you had such a good Friday. (laughs) It was, it was a great Friday. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, We hope that you enjoyed our conversation and it's some food for thought about recording conversations in the future. Bye everyone. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Veterinary Breakroom. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts, or drop us a line at podcasts at vetmedics.com. Veterinary Breakroom is a Vet Medics production produced by Alexis Ussery and co-hosted by Dr. Alyssa Watson and Dr. Beth Mollison. 